All right, so we're at Module 5, and Module 5 is it includes quite a bit of information. So you'll notice that this particular uh, lecture has some questions within the uh, lecture series. Pay attention to those questions um, because they'll certainly be important. Now, this is Part 1. Part 2 will be more about quality. So you still will need to refer to Chapters 10 and 23 of Marquise and Huston and Chapter 11 of Mason as we move further along. So the question can be posed, why is, why is there a need for nursing to be involved in the fiscal part of um, health care? Well, you know, the, currently within our health care system, there are many financial challenges uh, that not only impact organizations, but they impact our patients as well. And with all of the uh, entities of the Affordable Care Act, the nursing profession has plenty of opportunities that we certainly don't want to miss out on. So we know that there's shrinking reimbursement, rising costs. The regulatory controls also have financial implications. And quite frank, frankly, the public just simply wants to know, you know, why, is, why are things costing so much? Um, and then there's a shifting in reimbursement from volume to value. And so this is something that's really important and is now underscoring what healthcare reform really needs to be about. So to just kind of discuss how we got here, um, some of the way that we reimburse healthcare historically um, is we utilize incremental budgeting. And this is still used quite a bit, but if you think about the term incremental, it, it kind of means slow, step by step. And that, that has its pros and its cons, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but insurance, insurance carriers reimburse fully on a limitless basis, meaning they can get as much as they want. There's really no rules, and it, you know, the rules just kind of vary case by case. And um, so really the insurance companies just kind of could dictate and do pretty much what they wanted. There's really no motiv motivation in our healthcare system to save costs. Um, organizations didn't really need to justify changes. They simply did what they wanted to do. And then reimbursement was based on costs incurred plus profits, which is this fee for service. So there's no ceiling placed on an amount charged. So the end result was we had this uncontrolled fee for service reimbursement skyrocketing healthcare costs. So healthcare costs assume the greater percentage of our gross domestic product each year under um, our previous system. Now, what is the gross domestic product? Well, it's the monetary value of all the finished goods and services produced within a country's borders and within a specific time period. So out of all the goods and services produced, uh, health care was taking up the larger percentage. So there are some dominant values that underpin um, our health care system. Uh, since our healthcare system was really began in the private sector instead of being government ran, this allowed um, MDs to have quite a bit of power, as well as hospitals and insurance companies. So, uh, and and actually, the degree to which the government should be involved in healthcare is really quite controversial. Um, and so, this is why the dominant values kind of prevail. So. In our, our history of our country, we've had a long history of individualism. That's freedom to choose alternatives. And so if we were to put the government, government over health care, uh, folks feel that this might take away from some of that individualism. So there is an aversion to government uh, intervention. Um, and social programs are the exception and not the rule. Uh, they were really adopted during times of the great need um, where there was the depression and all those sort of things going on. And so healthcare has been viewed as a market-based co uh, commodity, um, readily available to those who can pay. And so that, that prevailing view has caused problems for people who aren't as fortunate. And this is where we've ended up with quite a few health disparities. Okay, so looking at healthcare from an economic standpoint, um, it's really an unusual animal. Um, we have certain entities that just make healthcare a little bit different. Um, 
One is information asymmetry, and information asymmetry refers to when one group has more knowledge than another group, and so this violates one of the violates one of the major tenets of competitive markets, and provides an opportunity for one group to potentially take advantage of others because there's really no safeguards. So within information asymmetry, it's really based on the fact that healthcare professionals simply know more than the patients, and so this gap of information is really why the Hippocratic Oath and the Nursing Code of Ethics came into being. Now, the current movement toward more transparency and partnering with patients in their care, um, and I would add uh, with the use of the web, information is becoming more available. But nonetheless, information asymmetry is present in almost every healthcare transaction. Uh, the second big issue is third-party payers. So public and private insurers pay the bulk of the cost of health care, but decisions about what services to deliver are made primarily by clinicians um, with some patient involvement. Um, most often, uh, the, some of the patients are far removed from the knowledge of the total cost. So individuals cannot always weigh the true cost and benefit of making a choice based on, um, based on what the cost is. So this violates another key assumption of competitive markets and that people can't really um, shop, really shop based on costs because we're not always sure what the cost really is. And lastly, um, there is, uh, because healthcare is often a matter of life and death, uh, services are delivered regardless of the patient's ability to pay. So uncompensated care has to be paid for somewhere by someone and so it's by a combination of government subsidies, higher charges to private payers who can pay more, and some healthcare workers accepting little or no compensation for some effort. So um, economically, the way our healthcare system is ran is also an issue. Okay, so here's one of my graphic issues. So the title of this slide should read PPACA which is, of course, Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, uh, their payment reform provision. So, uh, you know, due to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act and its focus on value, in which now we're seeking to ensure that changing the current pay payment system to one which focuses on volume instead of volume, uh, the Affordable Care Act has done this by removing incentives for redundant and inappropriate care, which was so needed. Now, this accounts for as much as a quarter of the nation's $2.8 trillion in annual health spending. I mean, all the uh, redundant and inappropriate care is quite costly. So the payment reform provisions include value-based purchasing, accountable care organizations, bundled payments, the medical home, and the health, uh, health insurance marketplace. So let's look at a few of these. So the medical home is designed around patient needs and aims to improve access to care through strategies such as extended hours, increased communication between providers and patients, uh, utilizing technology um, or, or, or different venues of communicating, email and telephone. Um, and this also includes increased care coordination, and all of this is done while reducing costs. So, uh, the medical home relies on a team of providers to integrate all aspects of health care. So payment reform is also a part of this initiative as financial incentives are offered to providers to focus on the quality of patient outcomes rather than the volume of services. And so like um, prior to, and you walk into any clinic, it was all about um, just getting volume, just getting people through. You know, it was looking at provider productivity. How many patients can we get in? Um, in a day or in so many hours. And so we found that, yeah, we were seeing the volume, but we weren't seeing great outcomes. And you still see a lot of this. Uh, now, the health insurance marketplaces, they're also called the exchanges. And these are basically um, the online insurance super malls that, you know, can't turn down prospective clients. Um, so that's kind of one of the new initiatives. It's a new resource for individuals and small businesses and so this is kind of a way that um, one of the, the big uh, things with um, the Affordable Care Act. Now, the ACOs or the Accountable Care Organizations, uh, their, their goal is really to deliver the seamless, high-quality care in an environment that's really supposed to be about patient-centered care. So it's where patients and providers are partnering in decision-making decision and 
and plans of care. So currently participation for patients and providers is voluntary. Uh, voluntary, yeah. So the Medicare Sharing Savings Program will award ACOs or, or Affordable Accountable Care Organizations that lower growth in health, health care costs while meeting performance standards on quality of care and putting the patients first. So accountability is key when we talk about accountable care organizations. Um, hospital value-based purchasing. Um, now this kind of started around 2013, and this is when these programs paid inpatient acute care services partially on, um, based on uh, quality care, not just in the quantity of services that they provided. So in uh, value-based purchasing, uh, providers are held accountable for the quality and the cost of the healthcare services. Um, so they are provided rewards and do have consequences. So, and these are conditional upon prospective um, performance measures. So incentives are structured to discourage inappropriate, unnecessary, and costly care, which we spoke about earlier that said that it costs in the trillions of dollars within our current healthcare system. So this initiative is expected to reduce Medicare spending by almost $214 billion. So we're supposed to be seeing some true cost-saving measures in this particular um, initiative. So now bundle payment is one of the last initiatives. This was passed in 2011 and was implemented a couple of years ago in 2013. And uh, these bundle payments give providers flexibility to work together to coordinate care for patients over the course of a single episode of illness. So that's a little bit about where we came from and where we're currently trying to go. But it's also important to note that prior to the 1980s, uh, nursing leaders played a limited role in fiscal planning. Um, nurse managers were often simply handed a budget. They weren't given any rationale and really weren't allowed to give any input. And quite, quite frankly, we really didn't want to give any input. I know when I was in nursing management, um, my statement was always, well, you know, I really want to focus on the patients and not the money. It's a conflict of interest for me. Not really understanding that the money was driving a lot of what I was able to do and unable to do. So um, at the time that this occurred, nursing had to recognize that um, we were considered uh, non-income producing. In other words, we were considered simply a cost. And so uh, all of us, so with us not having a voice, just added to the devaluement uh, or the, the undervalue of nursing. So now nursing leaders in the 21st century are expected to be experts in managing their, uh, managing their unit's budgets. But the question becomes, where do they get the knowledge, the training, and the education? Um, this is really a large expectation for those who uh, have not had the education or training, especially since the nursing budget generally accounts for the greatest share of the total expenses in most health healthcare institutions. So we now recognize that this is a learned skill um, that improves with practice, but we have to be at the table because healthcare is a business, and we're a key component of the business. So it's for this reason that we are now starting to include this in some of our curriculum. Now, this is certainly not going to give you what you need to manage a budget, um, but in a master's program in the leadership and clinical nursing leaders um, tracks, if you will, you would get much more of what's needed to manage a budget. But it's important to note that regardless, it's a learned skill that requires practice, and it just requires you doing it over a period of time. So something that certainly isn't intuitive, it's not something that just comes to you. It's usually neglected um, um, dimension of planning on our part. Um, now, fiscal planning should reflect the philosophy and the objectives of the organization. So that means that as nursing leaders, we have to be attuned to all of that. And this is, again, critical to nursing because um, healthcare is unfortunately a big business and getting bigger as we speak. And so we've got to learn how to make sure that we're advocating for the needs of our patients as well as our profession from a financial aspect. So what complicates this so much more for nursing leaders is that we're kind of in the middle of dealing with cost containment, quality care, and making sure that our staff are being able to do their jobs in a way that they were trained to do their jobs. So we're kind of balancing all of these balls, if you will, um, juggling. So 
what does cost containment really mean? Well, it refers to effective and efficient delivery of services while generating needed revenues for continued organizational productivity. It's the responsibility of every healthcare provider and the viability of most healthcare.